Greetings, troublemakers. Welcome to Trouble. My name is not important. The past couple of years have been a real kick in the teeth for those of us who dream of a world without borders. Not to mention the countless people around the world who had the distinct mixed fortune of not being born in the United States yet still have the audacity to imagine that they have been able to visit Disneyland at some point in their lives. Oh well, I guess Aero Disney is still a thing, right? Standing in firm opposition to bleeding hard, snowflake values of multiculturalism, equality of opportunity, solidarity and the inherent value of all human life. A strident new form of nationalism reaction has been steadily gaining ground in countries all around the globe. Often narrowly associated with Brexit, the rise of the European far right and the election of Donald Trump, this racist and panic-driven form of populism is a truly global phenomenon and one with incredibly deep roots. Nationalism is, after all, a central pillar of state power and a default go-to during times of crisis. So it's not a great mystery that after nearly a decade of punishing austerity measures and more than 15 years living under the specter of a global war on terror, many have fallen prey to the tempting illusion of security conjured up by strong walls and the politicians who promised to build them and Mexico pay for it. But even within this context of generalized paranoia and resurgent nationalism, there are many who continue to bravely fight for a better world. A world in which human beings are granted the same freedom of movement currently reserved for commodities. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll share the voices of some of these individuals as they speak about their experiences resisting increased border militarization, thwarting immigration enforcement, and making a whole lot of trouble. been crossing through this area since forever. A lot of the areas that we work are actually routes that people would migrate through seasonally. A lot of the folks whose land this is, the Taunata and Yaqui people. But more recently, the whole idea is, you know, to get from Mexico to the U.S. I'm a volunteer with the organization No More Deaths. We are a non-hierarchical, consensus-based group, and we do humanitarian aid in the border regions. We put out water on known migrant trails. We also do search and rescue. We document abuses by Border Patrol and different organizations, and we also provide assistance to people who have been deported and provide um, harm reduction kits for people who are gonna be crossing the desert. As we've expanded our work, we've expanded the areas that we're working in, and that includes some of the areas in the West Desert, around Ajo, Arizona, where people are walking across Oregon Pipe National Monument onto Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge, and then across about 20 miles of active bombing range. The journey north has changed a lot in the last 15 years. The urban centers were sealed in the mid-90s, pushing people out into the geography of the desert. It's a very intentional strategy on the part of the U.S. government and Border Patrol to increase human suffering and death along the border as an ostensive deterrent. Over the years we've also seen uh, the areas that we've done water drops and the areas that we've seen water drops moving have also become more remote. Essentially what we've done is we've mapped north-south trails and then we'll drive roads and do drops. But a lot of the drops that are closer to roads we've just seen a really big uptick in vandalism and we've also seen an increased um, amount of use in extremely remote areas. A lot of migrants get separated from their guides because the Border Patrol dusts them. A helicopter will come um, and fly very close to a group. People will scatter, get separated from their guides, and in this manner get lost and frequently spend weeks walking in circles. Folks generally travel at night. The pace of the group is very quick. If folks can't keep up with the group, they're frequently left behind. So a lot of the um, patients that we get at camp are very close to death when we find them. There's also been an increase in militarization in uh, the immigration enforcement in Mexico. So Mexico actually deported more Central Americans last year than the United States did. 
and part of that is with U.S. support through Plan Frontera Sur. Um, the United States is actually funding the Mexican government to implement border security on their southern border with Guatemala. I've talked to people who were riding the train and then to get around checkpoints walked for eight or nine days in Mexico. So by the time they get here, they've often traveled for over a month. Being identified as a migrant in Mexico from further south makes people vulnerable um, to extortion, kidnapping, and assault. I would say many of the women who have made it to the U.S.-Mexico border have experienced some form of traumatic violence um, during their journey. The goal is for people to have such a devastating and traumatic experience crossing that they are deterred from further attempts. It's very short-sighted and it does not take into account the reasons that people are migrating north. A lot of the reasons that folks are coming from Central America have to do with U.S. economic and foreign policy now and in the past. One of the things that happens under the auspice of democracy building with things like Plan Frontera Sur or the Merida Initiative is that the U.S. government is funding military and by extension paramilitary in torture techniques and repression of social movements. So not only is it keeping people from traveling north to escape violence, it's actually creating and perpetuating more violence. If you look at um, the School of the Americas and the funding of uh, the Mexican military to to fight terrorism and to fight drugs. One of the groups, the Zetas, was initially a, an arm of the Mexican military, and then they decided to break off and kind of took over the drug trade in Texas and in Matamoros and Tamalipas, and they've actually become one of the most violent gangs, and they were trained and funded and given guns by the U.S. government. It's like a joint business venture between the U.S. government and cartels. They have similar interests and they are exploiting vulnerable populations for money through different routes. Cartels make money because people have to contract with them now to cross and then the U.S. government and private corporations make money by incarcerating undocumented people before deporting them. There's a group called the American Legislative Exchange Council comprised of Republican legislators and corporate interests. And one of the corporations involved in this group is the Corrections Corporations of America, one of the largest private prison groups in the country. They got together and they wrote SB 1070, which was the law in Arizona that got passed a few years ago that deputized police to check immigration status. We live in the border zone. Within 100 miles of the border, police and Border Patrol have always had discretion to do whatever they want. But this kind of took that experience with the borderlands and internalized it and expanded it to all of Arizona and then with copycat laws that were passed to other parts of the country. It makes the risk of deportation that much higher. So if you know an employer refuses to pay their employee and they want to seek justice, it you know it's really easy for an employer to just threaten calling ICE on them and it creates an extremely, extremely vulnerable population. And that seems very intentional because it definitely benefits a lot of companies who are able to exploit this group of people that are now here. I watched Trouble, we gotta stop it. The colonial construct, widely known as Canada, is often depicted as U.S.'s mild-mannered and polite neighbor to the north. Oh, hey there. Do I know you from somewhere? Oh, me? No. Then what can I do for you, buddy? Well, this is a mugging. What? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. If I could just get that wallet right there. Okay. <laughs> Keeping in line with this popular caricature, many well-meaning and progressive Canadians see their country as a bastion of multiculturalism and a welcoming home for refugees escaping war and persecution around the globe. We have a celebration of diversity here that is just not found anywhere else. I mean, it's not really a question of the rules so much as it is the spirit of openness that we, that we cherish, um, that I think we're finding ourselves increasingly alone in the world with that spirit. But behind this self-righteous veneer lurks a more sinister reality of Canada's history and its place in the world. Putting aside the inconvenient facts that the country was founded on the genocide of the land's original inhabitants, a near blanket ban on non-European migration until 1967, and remains one of the only countries in the world to allow indefinite migrant detention, it's often overlooked that Canada only shares a land border with one country, the United States. 
I would not build a wall on the Canadian border. This particular quirk of geography has long granted the Canadian state near total control over who enters its borders and shielded it from mass influxes of irregular migration. Outside of a few historical examples, such as the Underground Railroad and Vietnam-era draft dodgers, or the more recent arrival in the summer of 2010 of a ship carrying 490 Tamil migrants on the shores of so-called British Columbia. But as the political atmosphere south of the border continues to worsen for undocumented migrants and anyone perceived to be a Muslim, Canada is witnessing a rise in refugees seeking to make use of its porous frontier to flee the overt hostility and repression of Trump's America. This is the cardamom. Is a nice smile, nice, very, very nice with coffee. This is the knaf, and I will see it's Palestinian. He do that. I am. I do that. Now, when you take the coffee, you can uh, taste it. It's very, very, very nice. You like it, man. My name is Omar Ben Ali. I'm from Palestinian. I lived my country almost 10 years ago. I lived my family, lived my kids, lived everything. Because maybe everybody here know what the occupation Israeli he do in Palestinian people. This is my son, Yazan. Uh, this is uh, the small uh, daughter, it's uh, Tala. She is now uh, 13 years when I'm lived uh, here, it's three years. This is my father. He died in 2014. This is my mother, my love, my heart. She is uh, die. She left me in September. I am not see her. I, I make refugee when I'm come in airport in 2008. After three years, uh, I sit down with uh, somebody in immigration, and in 20 minutes he refused me. And he, he sent it me after letter. Uh, he have uh, 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 around 38 reasons why he, he is, uh, refused me. 38. And he, he sit with me 20 minutes. I can't return because he know I have danger, very danger if I'm returned. He no accept to, to, to bring my family here. Now, if you ask me really what I want, I am okay, I'm live here, I'm half safe. But my family, it's not in safe. I need my family. I need my life. I need my, 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 my wife. We're at the uh, Lacol border crossing. This is the main border crossing between Quebec and the United States. This is uh, Highway 15 on the Canadian side and on the other side of the border crossing is I-87 that will take you down to Plattsburgh and Albany and New York City. And this is the border crossing you want to avoid if you want to make a refugee claim because according to the Safe Third Country Agreement, uh, if you're coming from a Safe Third Country, which the United States is defined to be, if you try to make your refugee claim here at the uh, Canadian border crossing, you will be turned back. And then if you try to make a regular crossing after that and they realize you try to make a regular one, you'll be forbidden from making a refugee claim. So there's an incentive. There's a logical, completely understandable reason why people will make irregular crossings. We're on the Quebec side of the Quebec-US border. And this is a place called Roxham Road. Roxham Road ends right there. And it continues right over that little hill on the US side. And it's a place that's internationally famous because people come here from the US in order to enter Canada irregularly and make refugee claims. Last time I was here, there was an abandoned baby carriage on the other side. You know, here you have some kids' clothing that, that was left. So uh, this is about as far as I can go, because if I, if I went further, another step or two, uh, I'd be on the American side. And that's technically illegal, and I'm not going to do that with the cops right there. People will come up this road, get off, of whatever vehicle they're in or a cab and then come across. Stop. If you cross here, you will be arrested. You speak French, you speak English.
Plattsburgh, New York is the main uh, gateway, and you can get to Plattsburgh. It's a several hours ride from New York City. It also has an airport, so people can fly in there. And in Plattsburgh, you can take a cab here. There's nothing um, mystical or dangerous about it. There's uh, thousands of miles of border. So we're here at a place where the RCMP has 24-hour surveillance, but there aren't walls, there aren't drones, there, aren't, there are motion detectors, but there's no way that this can be fully enforced. And if there are basic networks of mutual aid on either side, we can effectively render this border non-existent. We are in Dundee, Quebec. The border is actually a few kilometers from here. Since January, there have been a lot of people, more than usual, that have been crossing here. And that a lot of people in the region here have seen, have helped, and um, it just so happens that a community group, which deals with a lot of the community groups in the area, were having a spaghetti supper. So we came down from Montreal to uh, give them information. Here we have people that are fleeing persecution, people that are afraid for their lives, people that want to have a better life and want to participate in society. And they're being told that, sorry, if you want to come here, you can't come to our port of entry or to our airports. So for us, it was uh, evident that not just uh, you know, making information for the people in this region, but also for the people crossing to give them a little bit of a step up to uh, what are the hurdles that they're going to have to face. And we would like for them to know about it before they come. The attitude that our team takes regarding these people is uh, if someone is here for nefarious purposes or to commit crimes, we want to do everything we can to find out before we give them to the Canada Border Services Agency. So once they've crossed, as you said, once they've crossed, they cross, you can actively help, you can organize in your community to help people. And I think it's also important to say there's absolutely no reason to think, absolutely no reason to think that people who have crossed irregularly or illegally, however you want to put it, are any more dangerous than anybody in this room. And so even little gestures like putting a poster up that says, welcome refugees, welcome immigrants, that, that makes a difference, you know, it just sets a tone. During the summer of 2015, the world watched in collective awe as tens of thousands of migrants arrived on the shores of Greece and began gradually making their way north, past heavily militarized borders in Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia and Hungary before ultimately reaching destination countries such as Germany and Sweden. At the time, sympathy for the refugees, many of whom were fleeing brutal wars in Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq, was high. But it wasn't long before popular opinion shifted. That year, during New Year's Eve celebrations, a spate of sexual assaults took place in cities across Germany, most notably in Cologne, where hundreds of women reported being attacked by groups of young men from the Middle East and North Africa. While it later emerged that some of these incidents were fabricated, such as an alleged mob attack by Syrian refugees in Frankfurt, the horrendous event of that night nonetheless cemented the racist caricature of the refugee in the popular consciousness and helped kickstart a furious anti-migrant reaction that was soon exacerbated by terrorist attacks in France and Belgium. In the months and years that have followed, the gates of Fortress Europe have slammed shut and the Schengen Treaty guaranteeing free movement within Europe's interior borders has been effectively torn up, leaving thousands of migrants stranded in perpetual limbo. Responding to this dire situation, many anarchists and other activists have stepped up to try and help provide services and a sense of community to those who have been rendered stateless in a foreign land. We had a tent camp in the beginning for two months in the outskirts of Amsterdam, where people were camping in the mud, in the rain, in bad tents, getting sick, without any assistance from the state, just from the neighbors and people like me being there to support them. So they had a hard time, they suffered, and then winter came and there was an empty church building that was facilitated by squatters in the neighborhood. And from there, it took about 25 other buildings to uh, give shelter to we are here. 
Uh, we are here as a collective of uh, refugees from different countries, different nationalities. We focus on the people who have uh, uh, demand asylum in the Netherlands. Since 2002, there's a lot of uh, refugees have been kicked out on the street. Women, children have been detained. In Holland, it's a long tradition, especially in Amsterdam, to take empty buildings and use them as a space for living, for working, for culture, for anything. However, the, um, the state has managed to control the squatting movement by making it illegal. So it's hard to squat and stay inside because opening a building is one thing, but staying inside for a longer time is something completely different. And in a way you can say that we are here, the Refugee Collective, has saved squatting because it's easier for people to accept squats for refugees than for punks from England or tourists from Spain. So the squatters were quite eager to help find buildings for the refugees and for the police and for the justice and the politicians, it was not so easy to evacuate a thing that raised a lot of compassion and solidarity and sympathy among the society in general. People have to move from place to place because we always be facing uh, eviction from building to other, you know? It's very important for the system to keep us, you know, busy with something. Because if they give you a chance to relax, then you will think on your situation, then you will create more demonstration and that disturb them. The, the system, so that's why they have to keep you busy by building to building. We are here to get a life, better life than we are Normal having in Somalia. The life okay. is not too good and like Canada. Have, uh, the, um, the period we will stay here. But still we don't have anything, Trouble. but we are waiting. Trouble. We still have hope we will get something. The self-organized solidarity towards the refugees started uh, more or less two years ago that we had uh, the first Afghani refugees been stranded in uh, Athens. So what happened, we had a lot of uh, refugees residing in a nearby park in the Exarchia neighborhood. We tried somehow to help them out with water and stuff like that. Then we realized that there were around 300 people. Water wasn't enough. So we made the call to an, an assembly, hoping that it would be enough people to support them for another five days at least. And hundreds of people showed up from all around Athens. All together, we try to self-organize and uh, at the same time, in a way, relearn what self-organization is. So for a month, we provided uh, medical care, clothing, uh, three meals a day, tents so they could sleep, uh, sleeping bags so they could take with them on their journey. Uh, that was the beginning of the major self-organization uh, solidarity towards refugees. And from there, two more uh, initiatives uh, popped up. One was uh, Notara Squad, the first housing uh, squad for refugees. And uh, the other one was uh, Platanos, a uh, self-organized camp, let's say, that was in Lesbos, that was in the front lines. When we was uh, in uh, Hius Island, there were uh, a demonstration. We, we talked with them, we make uh, something like friendship with them. They told us when you go to Athens, we know a place that it's very good. So for the first time that we get in uh, Athens, we came to Plaza. I would say City Plaza is a refugee accommodation space. But not just this, it's also like a political project. More or less 400 people are living inside of City Plaza. You have so many different nationalities inside here and so many different people with so many different backgrounds and intentions. I know the history of uh, Plaza. It was a hotel for uh, Olympic in Athens. It was closed and nobody used it. So the anarchists, they unbanned it and uh, they repair it. They help a lot of people, a lot of refugees to come here and live uh, a little bit better than uh, the other uh, camps. As far as I know, we haven't lost not even one immigrant or refugee. No one has committed suicide or got killed in camps. You have all the time suicides, uh, desperate people, people that are dislocated from uh, the major uh, city centers. And in, in contrast to that, you have the squads that are in, inside the, the fabric of the city, and especially Exarchia, that we have uh, more than six squads, housing squads for refugees in England, that you see the people in the squads that are actually 
not integrated, but they feel part of this small community. Giving the central role that they play in shaping and determining the course of our lives and the massive amount of resources put into militarizing and securing them, it's important to remember that at the end of the day, borders are just imaginary lines. For the vast majority of human history, borders didn't exist. They are, and have always been, tools of colonization used to divide the world into distinct populations that can be placed at the service of competing centers of power. Their imposition has always provoked resistance and has only been made possible through the massive application of organized violence. Under today's increasingly globalized capitalist system, their primary function is to carve the world into distinct economic markets that can be more easily managed by local governments for the benefit of a transnational corporate elite. Politicians and media outfits simultaneously present borders as impenetrable barriers and fragile bulwarks of civilization constantly under threat from dangerous outside forces. But the reality is that they are arbitrary make-believe lines intended to keep regular people divided and fighting amongst ourselves. By demystifying borders and robbing them of their power to control our lives, we can come to a better understanding of our collective interest as human beings and begin to act together to dismantle the system they were meant to uphold. We were uh, something like 80 person on that boat. It was uh, so dangerous. They just told us, you have to go straight. They say, uh, you have to just go straight and that mountains in front of you, there is a uh, Greece. And anybody of you know how to drive this boat? The current political climate is pretty terrifying for a lot of directly affected communities and it's not clear how it's going to shake out. This is a really crucial moment for people to be doing organizing against the internalization of the border. Having a criminal history, even if that just means crossing, disqualifies you from most forms of relief. So what that means is anybody who has been caught crossing the border has almost no prospect of ever having legal status in this country as it stands currently. So it's really important to push against this idea that it is okay to deport criminals or that somehow the category of criminal is a legitimate one. People should approach local organizing wherever they are with the same urgency that we approach organizing on the border. If you can keep somebody in their community by doing anti-deportation work or creating protection networks, um, that means people aren't going to be coming back through the border and aren't going to be crossing through the desert. And that might be putting together protection packets and different things. It's not always glamorous work, but um, it's extremely important to keep communities whole. Just show up and be humble and um, be ready to listen and do your homework um, and learn about what's going on and have a real open heart. Once they're here or they've crossed the border, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Uh, what's their possibilities of staying? How are we going to help give them proper community support that, uh, that we would want in the same situation? We need to make regular and normal irregular crossings. We need to make regular and normal the idea that it's perfectly natural to just walk across and that these states that are defined, the Canadian colonial state and the American imperialist colonial state, are things that we resist and we oppose, but we're not gonna let the borders get in the way of us having mutual solidarity. We can't say, hey, we don't want you here, but we go there and we destroy your land and we take your resources and we say, hey, now there's no clean water, but we got tons of clean water here. We're not gonna help you. We all have a history and we all have a lineage of how we got here to this exact place on the earth. There's an expression that often the, the police is in our head and I feel the border is in our head as well. Yes, if you cross right here, the RCMP are right there, and there's likely some level of ICE uh, enforcement uh, going on. But uh, just a few hundreds of meters that way or that way, you could cross. There's no way that this thousands of miles of border can be enforced. I think, you know, closing border, this is not really, it's not a solution and it's not going to work. As long as they close the border, as long as the people will get more motivation to communicate with each other. Look, Berlin border, you know, which is uh, divided uh, West and, and, and East Germany before. 
look at after how after how long people just breaking it out. And Germany now is one country. I'm not sure about you, but I was born with two legs and they function, so I walk. And I walk where I want to go. This is called freedom of movement. We found out ourselves in the street. The only one thing we can do to help ourselves is solidarity together. That's how we start. Solidarity and creating visibilities. In my view, solidarity requires the capacity to step in the other's shoes. Not so much erasing the differences, but using the diversity to move forward. We learn from them how to evolve uh, our language and how, how we can uh, break the borders of our mind and political beliefs and lower them so we can listen to them. So the whole process of finding the common ground with people that come from a completely different cultural, social, political background and meeting somewhere in the middle and they're trying to form a new kind of uh, space. I think it's one of the best political actions that can happen. And because you know afterwards what follows, that the person who is next to you, he, she might not say anarchist, but you know, he, she is a comrade in a, a much deeper kind of sense. Charity is not the right approach in my view, because that's not solidarity. Compassion is okay. Compassion in the sense of trying to feel what the other feels and see how you can walk along together. But again, compassion itself is not enough. You have as an individual to use your powers and your skills, put them to use like everybody else. And I think that we can learn a lot from each other as long as we're rooted and grounded geographically in our place. It's great to go other places to learn about struggles as long as you can bring it home. We have the tendency to react to things. If they do something, we react to it. No, no, we have to create the events that it, they will make the others to react on us. If it's a movement, it, it has to be everywhere. You know, we have to create a, a network. We have to, all together, to organize, self-organize, you know, in something grander. Migrants who are not able to return to their country and are not allowed to stay, where can they go? They ask for normal life. Looking for trouble? As we continue to face increasingly destabilizing wars, surging global inequality and climate change, fueled ecological devastation, the coming century is poised to see unprecedented level of human migration. Exactly what forms this takes will depend in part on our collective initiative and our capacity for enacting meaningful solidarity that stretches across and ultimately undermines the borders that currently divide us. So at this point, we'd like to remind you that trouble is intended to be watched in groups and to be used as a resource to promote discussion and collective organizing. If there are no local migrant support or anti-borders initiatives in your area, please consider getting together with some cameras screening this film and discussing what kind of project would work best. Interested in running regular screening at your campus, info shop, community center, or even just at your home with your friends? Become a troublemaker. For 10 bucks a month, we'll hook you up with an advanced copy of the show and a screening kit featuring additional resources and some questions you can use to get a discussion going. If you can't afford to support us financially, no worries. You can stream and or download all our content for free off our website, south.media slash travel. If you have got any suggestions for show topics or just want to get in touch, drop us a line at travel at south.media. We're excited to see that people have been busy setting up Troublemaker chapters and I want to send a shout out to new chapters in Williamsburg, San Jose, Santa Cruz, Cotali, San Antonio, Cambridge, Burlington, Amsterdam, Milwaukee, Springfield, Sokol, Sherbrooke, Dunside, Ottawa, Chicago, Madison, and Slovenia. This episode wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of Brandon, Julian, and Ross. Now, get out there and make some trouble! We from that home of the Cisa Puente, house of the insurrection, where 1070 meets 187. No love for brown complexion, silence is acquiescence, where non violence protects and serves the 1%. We from? we from that land of the man in the maze, where criminalization, militarization got our fists raised. Put them up, take action now, we revolutionary but indigenous.